Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You have reached the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that dares to dig a little bit deeper. It is Thursday, December 10th, 2020, and tonight we're kicking off the 62nd meeting of the No Name Cinema Society, and we're doing with the review of the current feature, Mank, currently on Netflix, directed by David Fincher. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here for this evening. I'm home in LA, at least for the foreseeable future, possibly for the holidays. I got Bogey here behind me, who was around at the time of this film takes place, just about to become a major star. Um, so, and I'm lucky also to have these colleagues uh, available to me virtually to discuss this latest David Fincher film. First, ladies and gentlemen, the tortured, liberal, self-destructive, but below the liner, Alex Evans is here. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. And also, ladies and gentlemen, my boy genius sound designer who demands perfection and takes credit for it, Matt Polis is here. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Alex. Nice to see you. Very exciting. So before we get started, I just want to share with you this, the schedule for our upcoming 60-second series of episodes this month. It starts, of course, tonight with our review of Mank, and it will continue on Monday, December 14th, with our Indie Spotlight review of the film Cretia from 2015, and continues on Thursday, December 17th, the week from tonight, with our classic movie discussion, the 1987 classic, The Princess Bride. And then on Monday, December 21st, Alex will be back with me for our 46th sound off. He's going to debut a new segment. I've got an announcement. And Alex, Patrick, and I will all be counting down our top five William Golden films. So guys, that's the schedule for the upcoming episodes. There's some rare circularity with this particular film tonight. Tonight we review a film about a man who we've actually reviewed on the show. We've obviously discussed Citizen Kane itself in episode 37.3, but also in episode 50.3, that's 5-0, we reviewed the film The Pride of the Yankees, also co-written by the subject of this film, Herman Mankiewicz. It was one of the films from our 1942 in review, as was The Magnificent Ambersons, another film we reviewed directed by Orson Welles. We did that in episode 52.3. Not only does Orson appear as a character in this film, but so does the other Mank, Herman's younger brother, Joe, whose film Cleopatra we reviewed in episode 31.3. Joseph L. Mankiewicz would eventually outdo his brother in that he would direct his own pictures and would become one of three people to win back-to-back -back Best Director Oscars, 1949 for A Letter to Three Wives, and 1950 for All About Eve, which I had the opportunity to introduce Alex to just last year, back in the day when we could go to screenings in public in the park. That was a good that one. Was just, that was just last year, right, Alex? I'm not imagining. I think there was that it was that much just last year. The Hollywood Forever Cemetery has screenings in the summer. They used to, anyway. Did a little trivia, now a little summary. You guys ready for summary? Yeah, I believe I am. All right. Mank! Hollywood screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz is sent off to a quiet shack in the desert to write what will become the first film from acclaimed theater and radio director Orson Welles. While there, he remembers a series of events from his past that will inspire the eventual script that would become Citizen Kane, generally considered to be the greatest film of all time. It's time for opening thoughts, getting right into it. And uh, who, goes over thought, who goes first for opening thoughts? It looks like it's going to be Alex. One sentence. How did you feel about the film? It was really detailed and intricate in a way that made me have to watch it a time and a half in order to really get through all of it. Interesting. You need to go back. All right, cool. Matt? I was super excited for it, and it did not disappoint me. Um, but I was, I was maybe looking for a little more Fincher, but I still like the movie despite that. I mean, the script was written by his dad. I don't know how much more Fincher you can do. Uh, there, it's multiple Finchers on this one. But for me, my opening thought is, ironically, like Citizen Kane itself, it's a great example of how outstanding film direction elevates an overwritten screenplay. So, guys, maybe we can start there with uh, with direction, uh, because for me, I think that that's what really sets it apart. In our very last episode, which was the sound off, we counted down the top five directors working today, and David Fincher did make the list at number three, for me anyway, and you can look at it's episode 60. 1.4 if you want to see who else made that list um and this film is another example why he would make the list for me and uh, it's style uh in this particular film that makes a difference all the stylistic choices that he makes is spot on everyone that i could see the first and obvious most bold choice was to utilize movie techniques from the time in which the film was taking place not just the black and white cinematography but also shot selection more limited camera movement deeper focal length and a more methodical pace within scenes. Uh, and maybe that's why Matt 
felt like it was less Fincher because he was taking stylistic ideas from a different time period. Also, the score from his frequent collaborators, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, often echoed Bernard Herrmann's work on Citizen Kane, but still managed to be original and vital. I wasn't sure who his collaborators would be, and I was excited to see that both, from my perspective, his sound designer and his composer are the same that's been for years. And I wanted to see how they adapted to this new context, which is very different. You identified a couple stylistic choices. We can get into it later, but there were some sound things as well that were limited to the style and technology of the time. And I think they all did an amazing job. But yes, you're right. That's why I, I like Fincher because his new films are very modern and cutting edge. And this was specifically not that, not to the detriment of the film, but just not what you might ex you know, expect going into it. Alex, do you have anything on those things? Yeah, I, I really like the use of the dolly through a lot of it. And it really did feel like it had the shot design of the late 30s. And and I th very specifically a dolly instead of a steady cam. And I think that was a very you know clear and, and important choice in terms of choosing how to move your camera. Dolly is something they would have had uh, then as opposed, and they would not have had a steady cam or a zoom lens, quite frankly. You can feel the wheels of the dolly in a way. And that's why it's if he like in intentionally gave himself a, a physical limitation of the camera that couldn't let him do fancy maneuvers, even if he wanted to. Um, audio wise, you may not have noticed, but I picked up on it. There was an excess amount of what I felt like a little artificial reverb, all the interiors. The technology of the time for sound post was a limited set of reverbs and they just kind of applied it to the whole audio and everything kind of sounded like they were in a um in a space that was a little bit larger than than it looks on the screen and i noticed that immediately from the first location and it kept going throughout a little bit less in the exteriors but it sounded a little like just artificial you're right that the sound stuff is not something i noticed but i'm so glad you called it out on this program because it's it's not something we talk about as much and certainly enough every once in a while we talk about sound design so i'm glad yeah. you're here to help us out with that but there's a word that you use that i think is really important it was a word that i kept noticing in terms of things in the mise-en-scene, and the word you used was artificial, because I think throughout the film, I found several details representing the artifice within real life, not just in the movies. The costume parties at San Simeon, the contents of bottles and boxes are not what they seem at various points in the movie. Again, artifice, constantly using the mise-en-scene to blur the lines of fact and fiction. Tons of detail in the mise-en-scene to further this idea. Not only did Fincher and his design team beautifully recreate San Simeon and old style movie sets, they also included rich detail that added depth and meaning, like the recurring elephant theme, for example. So there's this constant balance that I wanna talk about in the T word, but the lines between fact and fiction were constantly being blurred. And I think your sound choices, that falls in line with that concept that was certainly part of the audio strategy the design for sure they didn't have to do that it was not something they did accidentally so i do want to talk quickly about performances performances in david fincher films are, are generally pretty good and that's the case here the majority of the ensemble is great not necessarily amazing gary Oldman's very good very detailed he's a great actor and generally i have no real bumps and issues he probably won't get my vote for best actor like he's getting buzzed for i can think of at least one 2020 performance i've seen that i'd vote for ahead of him I want to talk a little bit about Lily Collins because she never gets talked about that much. She was the real standout to me. I talked about her a little bit when Alex brought up Tolkien on his uh, top 10 of 2019. But I thought she was particularly good in this movie, bringing life and earnestness to a flat character, flat on the page. Interesting is she was also in The Last Tycoon for Amazon, which took place in the same world with some of the same characters, including L.B. Mayer and Irving Thalberg. I think she's very timeless in her performances in a way that makes her fit well into period pieces. Oh, we got a movie in 40s Hollywood? Bring in Lily Collins. I mean, it just seems to be this thing over and over again. It was just funny. What I think is kind of funny, Matt, and you'll appreciate this, more circularity, there are not one but two actors in this movie that Matt and I have both worked with uh, you know, in our past. First of all, the great Jamie McShane, played Shelly, the guy that finally gets to direct and it winds up being propaganda videos and he has to check his conscience and he has a moral issue with that. I'm trying to remember. Matt and I worked in college. Well, Jamie McShane was the lead in Repetition, Pendulum. Do you not wow. remember Jamie McShane? I remember the name and now I'm trying to see what he looks like now and 20 years ago or whatever. I, it was a long time I ago. Now. I see it now. So we've worked with him. Matt, did you recognize Joey Cross? Tell me. He played Charles Letterer in the film. The, the 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 guy that uh, that brings us into the studio in the very beginning he has the letter Marion Davies nephew he played the the young lead in my film homecoming from 2004 I couldn't find a picture of him 
from Mank. Current films are usually the hardest to find pictures of, but here's a picture of him from Homecoming. By the way, Alex, Charles Lederer, the actual writer, wrote a film that you and I watched recently. Which one? Charles Lederer wrote The Thing from Another World. You and I watched recently. But yeah, so that's not one, but two actors, Matt, that you and I have dealt with over the years. That's cool. Yeah. So David Fincher and I have the same taste in actors, apparently. Um, <laughs> you know, I bring them up. I, I will say, though, I do feel like they both struggled, or my perception was they both struggled in, in their roles. Uh, and it, I wonder, because I felt about the both of them, that is it because I know them that I didn't buy their characters? I felt... I felt them acting and it felt forced to me in both cases. Um, and I thought that was notable. I, so having not remembered them or Alex not knowing them, uh, do, do you guys feel similarly about these guys, Joey Cross and Jamie McShane? I, I bought them in the film. They didn't bump for me at all. Yeah, they didn't bump. I, I didn't have a problem, I guess. Um, one, one that stood out to me was Amanda Secret. For the first second she came on, I was like, wow, she's really doing something different that I expected her to do. And she really worked for me. Yeah, I mean, Marion Davies has always been an interesting character. I thought she was good. To me, Lily Collins was more of a standout. Amanda Seyfried did not bump for me, but she didn't stand out for me the way, same way she did for you. I just felt like there was so much detail in what I saw Lily Collins was doing. And to be fair to Joey and Jamie McShane, it was small stuff. It was just quibbles, like moments that I felt the performance. And, you know, I'm very sensitive to that sort of thing, maybe overly so. I want to get to my main issue with the film, and that's the screenplay. Now, on the, on the bright side, the extent of the research was obvious. There was a great amount of detail, and Alex sort of mentioned it, it was so much detail he needed to watch it time and a half. And I agree, like there might be too much detail, because, which may seem odd, but there were times where I wondered if the script was a little too much in love with the various little tidbits it discovered. Like there were times when it felt like it deviated from its momentum in order to sneak in a scene with another famous person. It almost felt like moments of indulgence. That's not my main issue with the screenplay, but I brought it up because Alex sort of hinted at it in his opening statement. I found the first 30 minutes to be really kind of self-satisfied with it, like with itself as a film. It was hard for me to connect with the character and pay attention to what was going on. And then it picked up from there. And I thought people were more interesting. Once I'd seen the whole film and because it's non-linear storytelling, it made the first 30 minutes much more palatable. I hadn't thought of it before you said it, but now that you say it, it actually makes me think that that mirrors Mankiewicz's character in the way that he always indulged in a small tidbit or went back for more or couldn't stop saying things and was always on the side of clever. Now I'm just thinking, well, that's a good fit, even if you didn't like it. I can see it as a justification, I guess. I still wonder if it works dramaturgically. I can see what you're saying. Do you do that at the risk of alienating an audience or the momentum of your project? He kind of did that in Zodiac. Zodiac was particularly long to sort of echo how long the investigation was. And I didn't like it there either. I just felt like at some point you lose your audience and it shouldn't have to be that Alex would go have to go back and watch. It's Fincher's job to get that sort of thing communicated without a rewatch, especially within the same hour that you watched it. I mean, the other question I had about it was the structure, um, which, which Alex alluded to. Um, I like the idea of mirroring the structure of Citizen Kane, but I'm not so sure it did that completely. Like it did it from a puzzle piece point of view, but not in the same way. Instead, it felt like more tired old flashbacks. And I didn't really think the transitions were executed to their utmost potential. I'm not suggesting Mank should have done the newsreel interviewer approach, but multiple perspectives or point of views on, on the subject might have been a nice echo to the Citizen Kane tone. I also think the flashbacks should have been more directly tied to whatever moment was happening in the screenplay he was working on. I think it might have more acutely tied the themes together, which I'll explain later. But I also think we were shorted in the character department in the sense that while they portrayed his alcoholism and, and his indulgence, they didn't really get into why. It's not what the movie was about, I understand that, but it just sort of accepted his addiction and moved on. And They used these title cards that were like scene headings from the screenplay. I found that kind of took me out of it. Uh, I didn't mind that. I wish he was like working on a scene on the screenplay and then it's sort of tied to, you know, what whatever moment he's flashing back yeah, to. Like, I wish the there was more a little awkward. I wish there was more connection between the two timelines ultimately. Because it is ultimately two timelines, even though they're they're pulling from, you know, yeah. they're not necessarily going in order in the flashbacks, but they're you but, know, it's but, still ultimately two stories going on. It did feel like a drunk person telling three stories at once. So again, that Fincher and his dad have this idea about structure, you know, uh, connecting it to Mank, but, you know, is that the best thing for the audience? Like, I don't yeah. know. Well, I agree that the flashbacks didn't come organically from what was happening. 
I liked the title cards. It felt very movie-like, and the whole thing is wrapped in movies and technique, and I, and I liked it. But it only went one direction, which would make sense if it came from the narrative like you were hoping for, like it entered into the flashbacks through the script. Since it doesn't do that, why then does it not come back through another title card? He did it in the first one, the first time we were in pr present time, being 1940, and then he abandoned it altogether. I thought that was curious as well. I just yeah. don't know why that it didn't come back and forth because it wasn't actually a script referenced in the movie at all. I, I agree with that completely. My final issue with the screenplay is related to individual scenes. There were some scenes that were masterful and beautiful, but there were some scenes that I thought got really overly political, overly long, uh, particularly scenes at the Hearst parties, and became extremely talky, overwritten, and horribly didactic. And those are the scenes that took me out, that sucked the energy out of the film, and I felt by preaching, they diluted the message. Messages are more effective to me in movies when they aren't yelled at me. And quite frankly, the flowery language in some of them reeked of showing off, not for Mank the character, but for Jack Fincher, David's late dad, who wrote a lot of it. I mean, like, I understand Mank had a way about him, but I mean, like, I sometimes it felt like it went too far, particularly in those scenes. Th that was a barrier for me. Did, Jonathan, did you like Social Network? I like Social Network. I don't love Social Network. I, I like Gone Girl and Girl with Dragon Tattoo a lot more. So I know it was Sorkin, not his father, writing it, but it had that similar sort of like words, words, yeah. words, lots of flower. I happen to love that. I like Sorkin's writing a lot. It wasn't written by Sorkin, but it had that feeling about it, you know? I often think Sorkin's, his films, and particularly Molly's Game Included, are overwritten. That is a complaint I have with Sorkin as well. Yeah, that makes sometimes. sense. I personally don't like Sorkin's writing, and I thought Jack Fincher's script was better. Than to be honest, it usually was. That talkiness happened occasionally. Like every once in a while, I felt like the film all of a sudden was getting on a soapbox and I sort of tune out. Um, that's just me personally. But I'm also apolitical, especially compared to, I don't know about Matt, but certainly compared to Alex. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, for what, Alex? Uh, brackets? No, <laughs> not with current features. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the T word, the section in where we talk about themes and try to break down the movie and get underneath what we think it's really, really about. The main theme of this movie isn't gonna be that shocking. And I'm gonna to refer to it as the power of media as what I consider to be the main theme of the film. Just like Citizen Kane was a not so veiled examination of William Randolph Hearst, this film is a not so veiled condemnation of Rupert Murdoch. And it's not the first time someone tried to make that comparison. It goes beyond that, of course, to rather bluntly suggest the power of the movies and by modern extension, the internet and media in general to influence people even those of us supposedly smart enough to sniff out the artifice. Even further and along the same lines, what is the role of the artist in all of this? Like the organ grinder's monkey, so many of us need jobs but are willing to make sacrifices to take those jobs. But do we make that proverbial Faustine bargain to sell our ideals and man might suggest our souls in order to get the next meal? What responsibility do we have as regards the art we create, some of on which we're just work for hire? I personally don't blame Murdoch or Hearst for using their respective platforms to voice their opinion, regardless of whether or not I agree with them. That's their prerogative as Americans, and I can't be sore at them just because they have a bigger megaphone. Where I, where I and I think this film take issue is when you deliberately deceive or fake events in order to get your message across. As the Walter Brennan character says in another Manx screenplay, Pride of the Yankees, that's dirty pool. So guys, I've got the power of the media as the, what I see as the primary theme of the film. I've got a couple that are sort of tangentially related, but what do you guys have on the power of media? Uh, I think it's definitely true there and showing how wealthy people can buy things. I mean, not everybody's voice is equal because the volume of your voice is determined by the extent of your wealth. It but also, of, don't you feel like they've earned that right by getting wealthy? No, nobody earns being wealthy. Like nobody labors hard enough to be a billionaire. If someone gives them that money, if they, if they make it, however they make it. I think it should be redistributed. I mean, that's not really what this podcast is for. So I don't want to go into it. I don't understand why they would have to give it back if they made it honestly. What I'm saying is what they did in this movie was wrong. I agree with that. I, it wasn't wrong just because they were wealthy. It was wrong because they intentionally deceived people uh, you know, uh, with their messaging, made fake things that they passed off as truth. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's where they crossed the line. But they didn't cross the line just by virtue of being wealthy. Well, I mean, buying up tons of ad space everywhere. That's their prerogative. All political ads, for the most part, of any party, like major or minor, are a bit manipulative and misleading. Like, that's just in general what that content is like. It's up to us, potentially, to not necessarily, you know, 
uh, buy everything that we that see or hear, you know what I mean? Or, or do, you know, be, be a little more careful about what we accept as truth. Matt, anything on any of this stuff? I love the little bookend of to a place that can make King Kong believable. You're not trying hard enough to prove a point. And then later, but someone is sort of saying, oh, do you think this will work? And then it's like, only for the people that think King Kong's 100 feet tall. And it took the guy a second to be like, that was Jamie McShane. <laughs> right, right, right. And then he's like, wait a minute, it, it is going to work. And that's what you're telling me. And it's incredibly powerful. And uh, this is exactly what's happening. And that's sort of my, what I'm getting at is us are trying not to be the people that believe King Kong is actually 400 feet tall or whatever the, whatever the line was. The onus is on us to, to be able to, you know, know the difference. I mean, even now when like fake news is practically every, every fifth word is fake news, we still have a trouble discerning which is and which isn't. It seems like everything is at some point. But no, maybe sure. back, back in that time where you were shown a newsreel, there's no reason to even think it would be anything other than what they're telling you it is. And then in this case, it was completely fabricated. So I don't know if it's reasonable to say it's up to you to decide. I think that's where the oversight comes in. But I mean, like, yes. I mean, I think it's up to them to, to not fabricate things. I, and I think I made that point. But, yeah. but I, the, the further point I wanted to make is it's, they're not bad just because they're wealthy. They're bad because they lie. My other theme, and I'm going to tie it all together, is artistic process. And I think the film dealt with this ever so slightly. And quite frankly, I wish it had dealt with it more. We do get to see glimpses of the mental and emotional anguish of creation. Not only what it does to us, but also what it does to those around us. We are inspired by all the little things that happen to us over the course of our lives. We may not realize it while it's happening, but when you sit down to put that in front of the proverbial typewriter, your life experiences find their way into the fabric of your work. But complications then arise because our life experiences aren't in a bubble. Unless you're holed up in the middle of a pandemic, your life experiences are shared or involve other people somehow. And what responsibility do you have when elements of their past find their way into your work because it's part of your past as well? And conversely, do they have a right to deny your own experiences from your creation, from your art? It's not like it's exclusively theirs. It's a question that's been wrestled with for centuries, and this film deals with that on the edges of its political goals. Everybody who's a writer brings in characters based on real people they know. And right. the base level of consideration, which Mank did, is create fake names in other places. Right. And I, I mean, like, I understand it, but I mean, like, you know, there is a moral question there, you know, like, and I, I agree that I don't think he did anything wrong. Certainly it was suggested that maybe he did. All of us, you know, when we've done something, you know, even almost subconsciously refer to something in our own lives and then it comes back and, and somebody questions it. Like, was this me or was this, you know what I mean? Like the, it, yeah, I, it, I, it felt like if you invited somebody over for Thanksgiving and treated them really well, and then they made a movie about you where they changed your name, but show you to be a fool. Um, that would hurt. That would hurt a person's feelings. That's a real thing that we all you deal with with people that are being creative and make it like writing books or movies. And sometimes it's not even meant to be hurtful. Sometimes you know you're you as a person inspire a character, but it's an exaggeration of you. And that's and what he said about the Marion character in Citizen Kane. Absolutely, yeah. So both of these themes, guys, tie together with around another theme that that Matt has sort of insinuated already, and I'm going to call it fact and fiction. In the film, the movie studios stage a fictional event as a way to sway an election, a la Wag the Dog. And also, Mank's allegedly fictional screenplay for Citizen Kane is peppered with things perceived as facts by those who read it. This, of course, is an allusion to the modern media landscape when I might read completely polar opposite statements from different sides of the spectrum. And in some cases, as Matt has already mentioned, I would have no means to verify what the truth is. I think the film simultaneously reminds us how important the truth is, and not just your truth, but in tr empirical truth, if you can find it. But I also think this suggests the importance of not assigning too much weight to things that we set out to be fictional, like Citizen Kane or even Mank as a film. Citizen Kane used the perspective of a couple men on another man's real life to suggest some greater things about the political and economic life in America. And quite frankly, Mank does the same. It is the perspective of a couple men, David and Jack Fincher, about the perspective of another man, Mank, long dead, about some real life events that happened 80 plus years ago. This film is not trying to be factual. It's not a documentary. It's a fictional movie featuring some real life people and some real life events to shine some light on our life today. And it's important that we're able to see the difference where we can. And this is the reason why I think 
so many elements in the mise-en-scene dealt with showing the artifice in quote unquote real life or what's perceived as real life in the movie and sort of constantly blurring those lines between fact and fiction. That sort of ties what you were saying, Matt, and to some degree what you were saying, Alex, I, I think. So that, that's sort of me trying to sum it all up. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I think there's also a line in the movie where they say you can't sum up an, a person's entire life or entire person in two hours. All you can right. do is leave an impression. That was a great line. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was a little on the nose, but but it but it fit. It did, yeah. Matt, so this ties back to your fake news thing. Yeah, well, uh, one way it hit me right away is I mentioned earlier I, I watched this film and then I finished watching Citizen Kane like immediately after, and up until that moment, Citizen Kane as a movie and Orson Welles as a creator was just you know number one genius of filmmaking of all history. That's just the common knowledge, and you accept it, and you watch this movie, and you assign it all sorts of greatness, and it is a good movie, but you assign it the greatness because that's what everyone does. And I was watching the end of Citizen Kane and I was watching Orson Welles be the character and himself and the, this whole thing. But having just watched the, the scene between him and Mankiewicz discuss the credits and the whole nastiness and like who actually wrote this and then he accepted the award. And it made me watch Citizen Kane, whether this film's truthful or not, like you're saying, it made me watch Citizen Kane differently. Like, oh, that guy, Orson Welles, isn't what I thought he was 10 minutes ago. And whether it's true or not, it made me, it, it spun Citizen Kane for me in a slightly negative way, which is a very interesting experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Alex, any other themes that I missed that you were thinking about? No, just I think how when wealth and power chooses to invest itself in media that uh, can have huge cascading, like rippling out effects. And that's an interesting point. And I mean, it relates to my the theme I said, the power of media, but it is interesting if if there was a way to and i mean like and that's that's really you know we talked about this in episode 49.3 when we did a review of the film pump up the volume but that you know like that is something about social media in terms of twitter and facebook and so forth is there is something of a great equalizer going on you know compared to to then because you know we have access you the three of us are on the internet right now you know, and, you know, we don't have people knowing us enough to watch us as much as those people, but we have the same platform, which is something that's new. Yeah, and I was I was going to say one of the things they talk about, and even Manx says this, is just like anybody who can write half a sentence thinks they deserve to be paid for being a writer. Um, and just kind of that elitism and anti-democratic view on information Um it's kind of like you want a gatekeeper like Hearst to determine what goes into the newspaper or what gets on the radio. That's the flip side. And that's why we're in the fact versus fiction, what's fake news, yeah, what's I not, is because I, everyone has a voice. And so who do we listen to? Another episode we've done on the square about the Egyptian right. revolution and how social media played into that. The audience, that's episode 50.2, 50.2, but good. Regular people from all sorts of different viewpoints of different groups that were able to interface and come together for this huge thing that was unlike anybody had experienced in their lifetime. I hadn't thought of it that way. Like you talk about investing in media and I wonder if like there's something to be said for the SEC putting limitations on the amount of media that one conglomerate or one set of people can own, like ceilings that might have some real value to potentially balance some of this out. Do we want to be fully democratic about the media or do you want to have you know, the gatekeepers? And the thing about the gatekeepers is that's a lot of power. The gatekeepers are not democratically selected. They might be selected by a democratically elected leader who then appoints them. It's not something we as citizens get a say in. Even if we did, though, I mean, like, it, all, it should be like committees or something where it's not just one person that's controlling this information. I think they liked it more than I did. I liked it, but I, they seem to be a little more effusive than I am. Um, I, so I think, I think our next current feature is going to be Wonder Woman 1984 which opens on HBO Max and in theaters, for those of you that have access to theaters. I know we certainly don't. That open on Christmas Day. So I think that'll happen, which will make our next series episodes start on Wednesday, December 30th. That's our goal. Stay tuned on Instagram. We'll announce it once we know for sure. But that's the plan. Our next show, however, is just this Monday, uh, December 14th, episode 62.2, and which uh, we're going to do our Indie Spotlight. We're going to introduce another society member to the Indie Spotlight of the film, Kresha, from 2015. And that's coming up this Monday, December the 14th. All right, guys, it's time to say goodbye to the audience. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, Jonathan. Bye, Alex. Bye, guys. All right. And to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.